It's Susan Hoffman here to welcome you to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts. Thanks so much for joining us. Today's topic is ADHD in children, and it's the first of a three-part series that we're offering on the basics of ADHD across the lifespan. We're extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Adelaide Robb to talk about key concerns in diagnosing and treating children with ADHD. So today's topic is children down the road. You'll will be uh, we'll have topics on teens, adolescents, and adults. Um, let me introduce Dr. Rob to you. She has incredible credentials. She holds, holds the title of Distinguished Endowed Professor and Chair at Children's National Hospital. She is a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine. A board-certified child and adolescent psychiatrist, she sees patients for medication and management of conditions such as major depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, autism, and ADHD. She also directs, and this must be very interesting, a large clinical trial program in pediatric psychopharmacology, looking for new agents being tested by the FDA for approval in children and teens. Dr. Rob, we're really honored to have you here join us to join us today, and we thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We know how, how, how much time this takes, so grateful. Um, I'd also like to thank the sponsor of today's webinar. We couldn't do this without our sponsors. We thank them profusely. Our webinar today is sponsored by Accentrate, A-C-C-E-N-T-R-A-T-E. It's a dietary supplement specifically formulated to address the nutritional deficiencies that are known to be associated with ADHD. Accentrate contains omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA, in the phospho phospholipid form that's shown to be the preferred carrier to the brain. Um, the brain-ready nutrition provided in Accentrate works 24 hours a day and helps the body heal even while you're asleep. So for more information, please visit www.accentrate.com, A-C-C-E-N-T-R-A-T-E.com. Um, let me just say a few um, uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. If you're tuned into the live webinar now, you may download the slides. You may want to print them out. You may want to follow along. You click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in purchasing the certificate of attendance option, please wait for about 45 minutes after the presentation ends and you'll receive an email with instructions on the certificate of attendance. And finally, if you're listening down the road, weeks or months from now and replay your podcast, you can visit the webinar, this webinar replay page on Attitude on the Attitude website, find the accompanying slides and the certificate of attendance options. So um, please log on to do that. Um, after her presentations, Dr. Rupp will be happy to take your questions. Please post them in the Q&A box whenever they occur to you. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Rob again with our thanks for joining us today. Thank you all for having me. And as I've already told you, we're gonna have a three-part webinar and I get to do the easy part. I get to do the beginning for children with ADHD. So what we're going to be talking about is some strategies for diagnosing and working with children with ADHD, how to identify and manage common challenges that you might see as a treating clinician, how to treat kids with medication, both initiation of treatment and titration of stimulants and non-stimulants, because you want to get to the right medicine at the right dose for your patient, and the importance of early treatment and management on the comorbid conditions to ensure that you have a successful start to school and going on to manage independent learning because parents really don't wanna be helping with homework when somebody's in high school. We'd like to get kids started early and have things move appropriately. Just to remind everybody in DSM-5, which came out in 2013, we had a couple of changes around ADHD. Number one, that you had to have the onset of symptoms before the age of 12. And if you were an adult, you only have to have five symptoms, but for the age group we're talking about, you have to either have six symptoms of inattention, six symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, or both. And you have to have impairment. In other words, it's getting in the way of living your life, either at school, at home with your family, at work if you're a young adult, or with your peers or on the sports teams that you're on if you're a child. And it can't be explained by another mental disorder. So if you're delirious in the hospital from COVID and you're not paying attention, you don't have ADHD, you have delirium from your COVID. 
This is just a graphic looking at the six symptoms of inattention, or the nine symptoms of inattention, and the nine of hyperactivity and impulsivity on the right. And then again, those rule in and rule out has to be before the age of 12, has to be present in two or more settings, has to get in the way of living your life, and it can't be due to another thing like schizophrenia or psychosis. The other thing that's important to remember is with DSM-5, you're now allowed to have autism and ADHD. Before DSM-5, if you had autism, you couldn't be diagnosed with ADHD, despite what pediatricians and child psychiatrists knew, which was they occur together quite frequently. So these are just some of the different other things that have happened and there are some challenges that remain. When you're talking, especially to an older patient, like a teenager or a young adult, self-report tends to occur as an under-reporting. So the parent may come into the office and tell you, my teenager's doing this, this, and this. And when you talk to the teen separately, they go, oh, well, you know, I really don't like to write papers, but I don't have any trouble paying attention to the teacher if I like them. And I really don't have a lot of homework, so I don't have trouble handing it in. There may also be some lack of definition around impairment. So what do you consider not functioning well? So if somebody's a very smart child and they're making C's and D's, that would be impairment. They're still not failing the school year, but they are underperforming based on their intellectual capacity. And oftentimes we have difficulty if somebody's got a comorbidity, if somebody's got prominent anxiety or they're very depressed, you may miss the ADHD because the comorbid condition is more prominent when they show up in your office and it's not until that's treated that the ADHD symptoms show up clinically. This I like because it's a nice sort of graphic of the different layers of ADHD. So if we start out in that purple circle in the center and think about the biologic difficulties, the core symptoms, which are the hyperactivity, impulsiveness, and inattention, and then the clinical issues that come out of that, like bottom left-hand side, psychological problems like low self-esteem. Kids with ADHD may think that they're a horrible student or a disappointment or they're stupid. Sometimes kids actually just think they're dumb. But the behavioral issues in the bottom right, like losing your backpack, losing your school tablet that you need for online schooling for this year, getting in trouble for talking too much in the classroom. And in the top right, all our comorbid conditions, and we'll touch on those later. And then all of the overlap in the top left with the family. Kids with ADHD are oftentimes the ones where if there's abuse in the family, they're going to be abuse because they're causing more difficulty and they're more disruptive to the family as a whole. If you're getting called in to deal with your child with ADHD by the teachers all the time, that gives you a hard time at work and keeping your job. Or right now, for parents who are trying to work from home and school from home, it's really hard to do your grown-up job while you're trying to help your ADHD second grader sit through online schooling. So there are lots of different family issues that are coming up for us in the time of COVID. How do you make an accurate diagnosis? And I think this is a key part of moving on to treatment. You really need an accurate diagnosis. There are certainly other psychiatric symptoms that overlap with ADHD, developmental disabilities such as autism and other comorbidities. There's no one magical diagnostic test. I can't order a blood test. I can't give you a brain scan. I can't just ask you a set of questions and say, yes, you have ADHD. You really need a comprehensive psychological evaluation, which can be very helpful in adding information about comorbid learning and language disabilities. And that's probably the most conservative approach. Not everybody's gonna do that. And certainly if you're a pediatrician in a busy office, you can do a Vanderbilt for the teachers and for the parent and get a good idea of whether somebody meets diagnostic criteria for ADHD. On a comprehensive evaluation though, you'll get rating scales again from the parent, the teachers, and for your teen patients, self-report. You can also observe in the office 
how the patient engages in the testing section and look at a psychological battery, both core symptoms and then more extended to look at comorbid difficulties. And with that, they issue a written report and that report, that testing report of your psychological functioning in regards to ADHD is valid or remains current for three to five years. And that will give you both a diagnosis and again from the psychologist treatment recommendations. And when you have a child in your office and you're wanting to get additional services from the school system, it's very helpful to have that report because it will say things like, patient must have time and a half for testing, must have preferential seating, must have, and they'll give literally a list of steps that should be done by the school system to help that child learn to the best of their ability. What about challenges that we face in the clinic and for these young people? So some of the common challenges that we might see running with ADHD include developmental delays. That may be delays in language acquisition. That may be delays in motor functioning. So if somebody's got poor fine motor functioning, it's really hard to do handwritten things, which are so necessary in elementary school before you start keyboarding. And children may also have delays in social development, so they may not get along as well with peers or they may have peer difficulties that co-occur with ADHD. Children with ADHD have difficulties at each stage of transition in their academic career. So the transition to formal school in kindergarten or first grade, middle school where you have to go from classroom to classroom, you have to be responsible for doing and remembering to hand in your homework and changing classes and sitting through block scheduling, which many middle schools have, that's a 90 minute class time. I can tell you most fifth and sixth graders cannot pay attention for 90 minutes. And it's gonna be even tougher this year as we're doing online schooling. High school where there's even more independence is another big transition. And college or going off to work where again, the academic supports that somebody who had a great school system in middle school and high school will not have. Again, we wanna be paying special attention as our patients make those transitions. The other difficulty for adults with ADHD is occupational functioning. So doing things like completing paperwork, meeting deadlines, all of those boring parts of any job are tougher for people with ADHD. People with ADHD can often have cognitive difficulties as well. So they may underperform on tests of attention, executive functioning, which is that organizational ability in your brain that lets you read five sources and come up with a report on trade in England during the Middle Ages. And things that require complex memory, like geometry is a great example. You get all those different theorems. You have to put them together and solve a math problem that's really tough for people with ADHD and executive dysfunctioning. And those deficits are not enough to give you the diagnosis, but they're very common in ADHD. People with ADHD may also have some emotional difficulties. It's not just focus and attention. So people with untreated ADHD may have poor frustration tolerance, irritability, they may be quick to anger and, and explosive. And by early adulthood, people with ADHD actually have higher risks of suicide, not as high, of course, as depression or bipolar, but they can happen even in people with just straight ADHD. The risk for suicide attempts and ideation is higher if you have comorbid mood disorder, conduct disorder, or substance use disorder. What are some of the non-core symptoms that are common in ADHD? And this is just all kinds of different things that can co-occur. And I just like to see the picture because it's not one thing and your patient may have difficulty with motor coordination and tics. You may have somebody else who's got problems with sleep and autism in conjunction with their ADHD. But it's important as the clinician seeing the patient, once you've got that ADHD diagnosis, nailed down, if you will, 
to ask yourself, are there other things that are traveling with it in my patient that also need to be addressed? Because without addressing those, we're not getting as far as we could to improve functioning for our patient. This is from the MTA study, which was a study done in the late 1990s and the early 2000s in elementary school aged young men, with, primarily young men with ADHD. It was called the MTA, the methylphenidate treatment study. And about 31% of kids in the light green had ADHD only, what one of my colleagues up at Dartmouth calls plain vanilla ADHD. Many kids had oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, tics, conduct, mood disorder at the younger age is the least common of the comorbidities. How does ADHD impact school attendance, health, social, and, and psychological well-being? And this was a study that came out in 2005 comparing kids and I'm sorry that they put in their graph normal, but kids without ADHD and kids with ADHD for rates of different things. So what you can really see on the left in the black bars is that people with ADHD by the age of 21 had a much higher rate of not finishing high school, being suspended from school at least once, and being expelled. That means, for those of you who take care of adults, kicked out and asked not to come back to school. On the right-hand side of the graph, we see all of the other difficulties that can happen beyond school. So things like substance abuse and 50% of 21-year-olds with ADHD compared to about 8% in their same age peers without. Incarceration, intentional self-injury, attempted suicide, again, it's up to 50% have, have tried when they've had ADHD repeating a grade, teen pregnancy, and that's because they impulsively have sex and forget to use birth control. And that's why they have higher rates of sexually transmitted disease and teen pregnancy, and also getting dismissed from a job. So if you don't show up or you're disrespectful, it's much more likely that it's gonna be hard to keep a job. Looking again, and this was another study done in the mid 2000s by Dr. Steinhausen at comorbid conditions seen with 1400 kids with ADHD. Again, in our younger age group, which is the group we're talking about, oppositional defiant is the highest comorbidity followed by conduct disorder and anxiety. Less likely things like difficulty with developmental coordination, depression, ticks in 8% of the patients and Tourette's in 1%. I think it's easy to make those diagnoses of oppositional defiant in conduct because those are part of the questions on our Vanderbilt that many of the pediatricians use. Anxiety is harder to pick up when you see somebody who's very hyperactive and running around in your office. It's hard to think that they would worry or be scared about something or anxious about something. But what I often do when I'm seeing people clinically with ADHD is say, not are you anxious because you're not going to get a good answer but what do you worry about and once you ask that question you will often get a list of things that the child worries about and then you can open that discussion around anxiety i know my pediatric partners down here on the virginia mental health access program often use the scared which is a free um rating form that will also capture signs and symptoms of anxiety. It's S-C-A-R-E-D, which is easy to remember for anxiety. In terms of other things that may also impact learning, we've got difficulty with phonologic speech articulation, receptive and expressive language disorders, and understanding written language, so reading problems. And so dyslexia can be up to 40% of youth with ADHD and mathematics difficulty or dyscalculia can be up to 60%. And I think if you've got a child that you're seeing as a primary care clinician with ADHD, you've got their symptoms controlled in terms of focusing and paying attention and they're still struggling in school, then it's time to go back and make sure you're not missing a comorbid learning disability or a language disability that's further impacting the child's ability to learn. 
Movement disorders can also be fairly common. Developmental coordination and also things like tics are common. And those things are frequently picked up in the primary care office because you guys are great at doing motor and tone examinations and looking for tics. Autism spectrum disorder. I know all of my colleagues in pediatrics are are asked to screen for autism both around 18 months with the MCHAT and later on. And it's important to remember that. If you're a developmental behavioral pediatrician or another person that primarily treats autism, just remind yourself that of your youth in your office with autism, up to half of them may have ADHD symptoms. And if those go unrecognized and untreated, you're going to again impact their ability to learn in their special ed program. So always ask about ADHD symptoms in your autism patients. And if you look conversely, if you're running an ADHD clinic, you can know that about 18% of the youth in your office with ADHD may also have autism as a comorbidity. So again, be sure to think about it when your primary patient population is ADHD. Some other comorbid behavioral difficulties that we may see in our youth with ADHD in elementary school included the younger age conduct disorder. This is things like cruelty to animals, running away from home, fire play, and other things like that. Antisocial personality disorder is more geared towards adults. We also know that substance use in general and people with ADHD and experimentation with substances occurs at a younger age and is more likely to remain problematic in youth with ADHD compared to youth without. <clears throat> and as our patients grow into the driving age, people with ADHD are more likely to have injuries. That's true at younger ages too. They dart out into traffic and get hit by cars and things like that. But as drivers, they're more likely to have traffic accidents and both moving so speeding, red light running, and non-moving parking ticket violations. People with ADHD in the younger age group, 50% of them will have oppositional defiant disorder. These are people that are chronically stubborn, disrespectful of authority, say no to everything, refuse to follow adult rules. So it's like permanent two-year-old. And up to 25% of children with inattentive ADHD rather than combined type will also have oppositional defiant disorder. Conduct disorder, again, that strict defiance of rules, cruelty to animals, fire setting, occurs in about a quarter of the children with combined type ADHD. And they tend to have a worse long-term prognosis than those without ADHD and conduct. The temperament issues that come up with ADHD also can impact both home and, and social life as well as learning in the classroom. So if people are temperamental, irritable, a lot of negative emotions, it makes it hard to keep peers and it makes it difficult to function in the classroom. And people with that emotional ability will often go on to have poor long-term outcome. Once you get to adulthood, people do start to develop some better coping skills, and my colleagues who will be talking to you at later webinars will go into detail on that. Depression is another comorbid illness that we don't always think about in ADHD. Again, somebody who's really active and moving all over the place doesn't look like our common picture in our head of a sort of slowed down Eeyore-like person with depression. But when you go to work every day and you have a hard time getting your job done and you feel really bad about yourself because your boss keeps yelling at you and that's kind of what it's like to go to school as an untreated second grader with ADHD, you start to have a lot of negative self-esteem and can eventually go on to develop depression. And depending on what age group we're looking at, people with ADHD can have rates of depression as high as 50%. That's more in the adult range, but even down into the younger age groups like we're talking about today, nine, 
to 15, 20% of kids will have comorbid depression. It's more common in young ladies with ADHD than in young men. And when they did look at adults with ADHD, 9% of them met full diagnostic criteria for major depression, and almost a quarter of them had dysthymic disorder. Treating the ADHD can often be very helpful in making the symptoms of depression less prominent because you can now focus and get stuff done. You may still need to go on to treat the depression with an antidepressant or with therapy. Anxiety is again quite common in ADHD. About a third of the children with ADHD will have a comorbid anxiety and in adult studies it's up to half. Sometimes people will have multiple anxiety disorders rather than just something like generalized anxiety. And we sometimes think about is the anxiety first and you're inattentive because you're so worried you can't focus and pay attention or did the ADHD come first and you're overwhelmed with anxiety because you can't get your work done, you're overwhelmed with the tasks at hand and you now are worried and scared because you're doing so poorly in school or at your job. And I believe that for many of our patients, it's two separate disorders that are traveling together. And again, you treat the ADHD. And then if there's anxiety that is left, you address that. Disruptive mood dysregulation is a newer disorder that came out with DSM-5. And in one study that was done by the group at NIH, they had 179 kids with ADHD, and they also met the DMDD criteria. Many of them also met criteria for conduct disorder and anxiety. And what they ended up doing was trying to treat them and look at outcomes. They noted that these children had more bullying behavior than the kids with ADHD alone, and much poorer self-control, and more difficulty in their family in terms of getting along with siblings and parents. So when we start to think about ADHD beyond school interventions, one of the things we always talk about is medication. And I think it's really important to sort of think about dividing it into two main categories. So on the left, we have stimulants, and on the right, we have non-stimulants. The stimulants come in amphetamine, which is Adderall, Adderall XR, Vyvanse, Dexedrine, and a number of other products. And on the right-hand side of the stimulants, the methylphenidate products, including all of the methylphenidates and dexmethylphenidate, which is the active enantiomer or half of a right and left-handed molecule. It's the dextro or the right-handed molecule. For non-stimulants, we're split into two main categories, stratera or atomoxetine, and then the alpha-2 agonists, which are long-acting guanfacine or intuniv and long-acting clonidine or capfe. I, I like this picture, it came out of the Washington Post, and it's just how we send signals in our brain. So if you sort of look at the far left, you have a cell sending out a signal with neurotransmitter release, it crosses a synapse and goes into the receiving signal. So ADHD medications on the right-hand side boost the signal, so you go from just like four yellow dots in the left-hand one in the, in the gap to a bunch of yellow dots on the right, either by increasing neurotransmitter release, so we're dumping more noise into the gap, if you will, or by preventing the end of the signal by preventing reuptake. So cells sort of recycle neurotransmitter. You dump it out, and in an optimal method of conservation of resources, we reabsorb it to be dumping it out again later the next time a nerve impulse comes down the nerve cell. So when we think about how that works, methylphenidate and dexmethylphenidate block the reuptake. So they do what that blue line in the far right-hand photo says. It's like plugging a drain. Amphetamine 
does both. So it increases the amount of dopamine coming out into the synapse and it blocks the reuptake. So it's like a double assault on the synapse. It dumps more out and it prevents it from being reabsorbed. List at dexamphetamine or Vyvanse works the same as all the other amphetamines. It just has an advantage of needing to be digested in the stomach so it's harder to abuse. But atomoxetine or Stratera blocks the reuptake, so it's just blocking the, the drain. So the exact opposite of what, well, sorry, it just blocks the reuptake. It does not increase the release. And guanfacine and clonidine modulate the release of norepinephrine and can increase or decrease the activity in various regions. It's less well understood why it works in ADHD than the other three categories of medication. And we're not even going to talk about the off-label stuff. This is just a very helpful graph sort of looking at, on the left-hand side, all the different kinds of either methylphenidate. Focalin and Focalin XR are just the dexmethylphenidates. And then what starting doses are, maximum doses, and on the far right, how long things last. I will tell you that we have regular old tablets. Daytrana is actually a patch. So like any other patch medication, you put it on your hip and it gets absorbed through the skin. And then Quilavant is liquid and Quilla Chew is a chewable tablet. There are other chewable tablets. I just wanted to give you an idea of the different options. For amphetamines, again, there are disintegrating tablets like Adensis, suspension. So again, a liquid, long acting liquid one, and then all kinds of tablets and capsules again, with varying duration of action. For some people, even though stimulants are usually first line, you may not want to use them if somebody's had a history of mania and psychosis. It's not our first choice. If somebody's got really bad depression or tics or anxiety, they may get worse. Those three conditions may get worse on a stimulant. So again, you may want to try non-stimulant first. If I've got somebody that's using and abusing things like cocaine and heroin, I'm not going to give them a stimulant because of the risk of diversion. And if I've got somebody who's not eating or not sleeping well on a stimulant, I may wish to change some of the medication to a non-stimulant. Atomoxetine, or again, the other name is Stratera, can be used for just plain ADHD ADHD that hasn't responded to stimulant treatment, you've tried a methylphenidate product, you've tried an amphetamine and we're not getting anywhere, you might try atomoxetine next, or for people with tick, anxiety, or substance use disorders in conjunction with their ADHD. The, the couple of severe side effects that you need to be aware of specifically for atomoxetine is that there are some cases of very rare but serious hepatitis or liver function abnormality, and an increase in suicidal thoughts and attempts on atomoxetine 0.03% versus zero on placebo. There was one suicide attempt in 1,300 cases in the registration trial, but no completed suicides. But it will show up on the labeling that goes home with a patient. So you as a clinician need to be aware of that. Alpha agonist, again, that's the long-acting clonidine and guanfacine, can be used by themselves as monotherapy. If you've got somebody on a stimulant, they can be used as per FDA guidance in conjunction with the stimulant. So for a partial responder, somebody's 50% better on methylphenidate or amphetamine, but you're still not where you need to be for homework and for the end of the school day, you can add in long-acting clonidine or guanfacine. They may also be helpful for oppositional defiant as a comorbidity and for ticks. What's the importance of early treatment? And I think that's the key part for us talking about this age group. 
if you look at treatment, there are a number of long-term outcome studies that have shown us that treatment with medication can improve cognitive behavioral and functional deficits. What does that really mean? Parents are asking you, why should I use this medicine? It can improve academic achievement. It can improve health-related quality of life. And when we look at long-term scans, which, which Dr. Shaw and Jay Gee did at NIH, it can actually normalize cortical thinning and functional connectivity in different regions of the brain involved in ADHD. Here is one of the many long-term follow-ups for ADHD trials that were done by Dr. Biederman and his colleagues at Mass General Hospital, including Dr. Willens, who's gonna be talking to you soon on another webinar. And this was looking at 140 boys with ADHD and following them out 10 years. So this is, you know, if you start at six or seven, this is all the way through high school. And looking at whether they were on stimulant medication, because when the study first started, that was our main treatment was stimulant medication, so methylphenidate or amphetamine, versus those who didn't get it. So we had 82 young men who got stimulant medication and 30 who never were treated with meds. And what they looked at were four different things. Major depression, so what you see in the blue line is if you got a lifetime stimulant, even out, this is 25 to 30 at the bottom, you have a much lower percentage of people with major depression compared to those who never got a stimulant. If we're looking at anxiety disorder in the top right, again, lifetime stimulant really lowers your risk for developing anxiety disorder compared to those who never had a stimulant. If we look at oppositional defiant disorder, again, stimulant reduced the risk compared to no stimulant. And having to repeat a grade so going through the sixth grade again, again, if you had a stimulant ever in your life, you were at much lower risk than if you were not treated. And here's another study that again came out in the mid 2000s, looking at the impact on school attendance. And I've already showed you this slide. I apologize for having it twice, but again, thinking about impact, I wanna remind everybody Treatment does more than just get you to sit still in the classroom. It has real impacts on things like being arrested, teen pregnancy, keeping a job. And that's part of what I talk about when I talk with parents. So I want to conclude by saying that while we make a diagnosis of ADHD by looking at those core symptoms, the nine symptoms of inattention and the nine symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, the associated factors that we have and the comorbidities play an important role in treatment. Because if I've got somebody with ADHD and I've treated their ADHD symptoms, but they still have a problem learning how to read, I'm not going to get them in far as far in school as I could if I had their dyslexia treated as well with additional reading support and some education on learning how to read. Many kids with ADHD will have a comorbidity and I think it's the clinicians caring for them. One of the biggest needs that we have is to make sure we screen for comorbidity and if we see it, we treat it. And so the other thing I would say to you is if you've got a kid in your office, you've diagnosed the ADHD and you've tried methylphenidate and you've tried an amphetamine and you've even added in some guanfacine and they're still not doing well, take a step back and say to yourself, did I miss a comorbidity? Am I missing a learning issue? Am I missing receptive language processing or auditory processing issues? And that's what's impacting things and impairing the school functioning? Or is this child also depressed and I'm not seeing it because I haven't asked those questions in the office? It's very important to remember, especially if somebody's not improving on treatment, am I missing something? And 
Well, we have a lot of good treatments, and I can say as a child psychiatrist, we've got a lot of FDA-approved treatments. I still probably have maybe one out of 25 or 30 patients where even with all of the medicines we have FDA-approved, I still don't get anybody, I still don't get one person as good as I would want them to be. And, and that's the other important thing I would want to stress to people is when you're taking care of a person with ADHD, when they come back to your office and they've gone through a growth spurt in the summertime and mom says, you know, they're sitting down and they're not doing so well this year and I don't understand, I want to ask a couple of questions. Do we need to titrate the dose up? Are they readjusting after summer holiday off meds? Or are they not even taking the medication? Because sometimes teenagers don't take their medicine. And so it's always good to have a conversation about adherence and to say, I never say, do you take your medicine? Because that puts us in a bad place. I say, you know, over the last month, how many times do you think you've forgotten to take your ADHD medicine? And I often get a much more honest answer when I when I ask that way. And they'll go, well, you know, I, I got up at 7 o'clock and the bus came at 7.10 and I didn't have time to get breakfast and take my medicine. So on Monday and Tuesday, I didn't have any. And it was really bad in geometry class. So it's it's helpful to have that ongoing conversation because if they can't tell you they're not taking the medicine without feeling judged, you're sitting there thinking you've got a, a really difficult to treat case when in fact we're dealing with adherence to treatment rather than lack of response to treatment. And I think that's really important to be able to sort of think through that with the patient and the family. And I think we're gonna answer questions. Okay, great. That was really fascinating. One clarifying question that I had and others that also had the slide that showed um, just impact of ADHD on social tens. Was this un untreated um, patients? This was primarily untreated patients. Untreated, okay, right. So there's no reason to think that these issues can't be addressed with a successful treatment plan. There's no reason to think that. And actually, if we go back to, I mean, on the, on the right-hand slide, the second bar was mm -hmm. incarceration. Right. And there have actually been some amazing studies out of Scandinavia where they keep, they have organized healthcare and they keep track of everybody. Right. And they looked at young women and young men with ADHD, with treatment and without treatment. And they could show lower rates. And I'm sorry, I don't have these slides. If you're really lucky, Dr. Willems will show them to you in, in the coming webinar. But what they could show is if you had ADHD, but you had treatment, you had lower rates of being incarcerated and incarcerated for serious issues than your peers with ADHD who didn't have treatment, whether you were a young woman or a young man. It wow. really made a huge difference in like bad stuff sending you to jail. Okay. Um, yeah, I, wanted to, I didn't want to let that, that slide rest without pointing out that was probably untreated. Okay. Um, um, I wanted to go back to um, evaluations for ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe, uh, I guess my question is this one, um, are rating scales adequate for a, for an evaluation for ADHD, given I think you described very um, very clearly the, hot, the, the necessity of evaluating for um, comorbidities as well as learning disabilities. Is that commonly done as part of an evaluation and should it be done? I think, I think it depends on where you are in the country and, and what's available for your patient. So not everybody's gonna be able to get a comprehensive psychological battery with like a Wisconsin intelligence scale for children, WISC-5 and learning disability testing. So I think the first thing you do is a real history and physical, make sure nothing else is going on and do a Vanderbilt. Then I think we talk with the school system. So if I've, if I've made the diagnosis of ADHD as the primary care clinician, and I've implemented treatment with medication and whatever help the school can give as a 504 plan, a lot of times you don't need any fancy testing for that. You need a letter from the doctor saying, I've diagnosed you know, patient X or young man X with ADHD. I'd like the accommodations that are available under a 504 plan, and that's usually 
preferential seating, extra time on testing, da 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 da. That's about it. And maybe less written homework sometimes is also available. That doesn't require any fancy testing. Once you move to an individualized education plan, which requires much more intervention on the part of the school system, then they usually want the formal IQ and learning disability testing that would be involved in a psychological assessment. If the school is giving an IEP, the school psychologist, i.e. your tax dollars in your county, pay for that. They sometimes do a more abbreviated battery than you would get coming to Children's National, for instance, and getting a full ADHD assessment. But it's enough to help dictate, do you have comorbid learning problems? And do you have other difficulties that need to be addressed from the educational system? The other thing that can be done easily, again, in your office without the big fancy testing is to have a speech and language assessment. Mm -hmm. So speech pathologists are often working with pediatricians offices already because we see lots of kids with language issues. And they can do an assessment of one, are we having any kind of a hearing issue, which pediatricians already check for, but are we having an expressive, so talking language problem or receptive understanding language problem? Because that can greatly impact focus and attention and learning because so much of school is audio learning, right? It's not reading, it's mm -hmm. the teacher talking to you. And that's quick. And if you determine a child has a language problem, that gets addressed with speech therapy in the school. And that is something that doesn't have a long waiting time and is part of childhood screening when you're worried about it. Okay. Um, great. That's, all, that's really helpful. Um, there's a bunch of questions here about medication. I think these are really okay. good, good ones for, for you as an expert. Um, uh, should kids take medication when they're not in school or on, the, on, on school vacation, in your view? So we as a field have gone back and forth about this. Right. We have to remember that ADHD does not go away when school goes away. So if you talked to the parents that I've been talking to who have been in their house with their children for the last five months and they see them unmedicated all day long, and some people live in a one bedroom apartment, I have more people remaining on medication over the summer because they can't do everything they would normally do. They can't go to camp, they can't play outside, they can't go to the pool, they can't ride their, they can ride their bike, you can ride your bike with a mask on, and of course, head protection. But there are a lot of things that add structure and an outlet for energy that are not available I will say that my patients with ADHD have had a much harder time learning online than learning in the real classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's been a bigger struggle and we've made medication adjustments for many people. They just can't sit watching a TV that's not involving a video game and pay attention for four, five, six hours. They start surfing the internet. They turn the block off, they block their photo. And then the teacher has no feedback from the kid. So the people that I put on a medication holiday are people who have growth retardation. They're not gaining weight and they're not getting taller on a stimulant, but they need a stimulant to function. And then we have a long discussion with the parents about how are we going to cope off medication in the summertime. Almost everybody else, I have them stay on. I wouldn't stop an antidepressant because somebody was on summer break. All right. Okay. Um... An interesting number of people who um, who've asked that question. Um, there's also a significant number of people who ask at what how how young can a child be for diagnosis and for treatment with medication? Three years old, five years old, six years old. There are a number of questions in that about that age category. Right. So, amphetamines are grandfathered in down to the age of three not based on studies in people down to the age of three, but they're grandfathered in for the FDA. So if you're trying to prescribe for somebody three to five 
amphetamines are the ones that are actually FDA approved. Having said that, the PATS study, P-A-T-S, Preschool ADHD Treatment Study, which was funded by the federal government, the NIMH, was in methylphenidate down to the three to five-year-olds. And it was back before we had long-acting liquid or chewable formulation. But that showed that you could safely treat kids for ADHD drought with methylphenidate ages three to five, but they did parent training and behavioral intervention first. And then they went on to do methylphenidate. What you do see in younger children, that three to five year old age group, is more emotional side effects on the medication. So more weepiness, sadness, mood lability, which can certainly happen on, on amphetamines, but it can also happen on the methylphenidate and more GI side effects, so loss of appetite. So if you're going to do it, those are the kind of people that I'd put on shorter acting medication and I would give off on weekends and holidays just because they're little. Okay. The, the other thing, just to let people know at in Washington, D.C. and in Seattle, Washington, sorry, those are the only two places, we're actually doing a federally funded study for preschoolers, well, three to seven year olds with ADHD by treating their parent with ADHD first. So oh, we're taking wow. the moms or dads with ADHD, we're giving them parent training either with or without Adderall to see if by helping the parents, we can help the child. Because we know from other studies of young kids with ADHD done by Dr. Sanuga Bark, three to five year olds with ADHD, they did this really fancy parent training of moms and most of the kids compared to just regular old parent counseling or just waiting around but there was a group of kids who didn't get better and when they went back and looked at it it was the kids whose parents had adhd that was untreated so really interesting since, since wow. adhd runs in families if we can help the moms and dads we're going to see if we can help the kids before we have to think about giving a three-year-old medication. Mm -hmm. If I make mom or dad less symptomatic with their own ADHD, can I head off the time that I need to medicate? Right. Okay. Um, there's also a set of concepts, a, a set of questions around the other end of the spectrum. So do you outgrow ADHD? Is it something that you have to stay medicated for life? Um, and then the corollary to that question, are there long-term consequences to being on ADHD medications into, for many years? So the, the best data we have on the long-term studies are either out of Scandinavia, where we already talked about not going to prison, and the studies that Dr. Biederman and his team have done about how we've had lower rates of development of comorbidity and other things by treating ADHD. What tends to happen over time is just imagine in your head the six-year-old who's climbing the furniture, leaping off of trees, running around, talking as a young adult. So what tends to happen, and this is why we used to think ADHD magically disappeared at age 12. When I first started in my training, that's what we all believed. In, until I had a young lady come to my office. I was a grown-up psychiatrist this is before I took care of kids. She came to my office as a student teacher and she said, you know what? I'm about to fail my class in my dream job. I can't get the lesson plans done. I can't get the paperwork done. And I feel like the kids in my classroom. And I said, well, grownups don't have ADHD, but it sure sounds like it. Let's treat you with methylphenidate and, and see what happens. Here I am off-label treating a 25-year-old for ADHD. And she came back in, in a month and she said, you saved my life. And you just don't think about it for adults. But when people are in college and when people are in job training, I think it's really important to treat the ADHD. So what does that mean? If I've got somebody who's like, I don't know, a computer programmer, and they're going to a five, 
day course on learning cobalt or something and they need this to be passed and certified so they can get a promotion at work and they really have to pay attention and, and pass a certification test, it's not the time to stop their ADHD medication. I had another young lady who got diagnosed at the end of high school and it made a huge difference. She used her ADHD medication all the way through college so she could do well in her coursework. And then she went into the um, service industry working for a large corporation in the service industry. And she had to go for some management training. We had her take her medication through management training. She actually called me to ask if we could renew her prescription. And we did that. And once the management training was done and she was back at work on the job that she had been trained for and it was more hands-on, she did fine with that and didn't need to remain on her medication. It really depends on what your job is and <clears throat> how much book learning and focus and attention you need to have, whether you need to remain on medication. But because what tends to happen is the hyperactivity goes away and the impulsivity and the inattention, which are so important for functioning on the job and learning, whether it's in college or on the job, does not go away over time, those things can be very impairing. If you're inattentive and you're impulsive, that gets in the way of getting your job done and keeping your job. So that still needs medication. Okay. And in terms of the long-term health impacts, there's a lot of concern among the listeners about the long-term health impacts of stimulants. We don't have a lot of good data on long-term health impacts. We certainly keep an eye on weight and blood pressure. Those are the two big ones. And, um, monitoring for more rare side effects like the development of ticks or Raynaud's phenomenon and things like that. I know on here it tells me that I have an extra 30 minutes on the webcast, but I actually have a... No, that, not a problem. They always say that. Asian, <laughs> yeah. Asian at two o'clock, so I will not be not able a problem. to... <laughs> we have three minutes left. Okay, <laughs> any other question? One last question, then. There's just so many questions we could... <laughs> um, some people have a problem um, titrating their medicine and getting a clinician to work with a child or an adult to get the right dose. Um, and we've also heard from people that higher doses than the FDA quote approved doses may work and their clinicians or pharmacists are unwilling to fill that prescription. Do you have any just in the time that remaining just general advice on, on getting the right dose of medication for a child or for an adult? I think the biggest thing is to titrate using a rating scale or there's the Vanderbilt or another one. So you're really tracking symptoms and there's mm -hmm. an adult ADHD rating scale as well. So I do that. Do I have people who are above the label dose? Yes, I do. And those tend to be the people that were the hardest to treat and continue to have symptoms even on a maximum dose. I will then go above the label dose and I will have a discussion with the insurance company about why I am doing that. Okay, so that's that's the answer when that when that happens that the yeah. clinician needs to explain to the insurance company and or possibly the pharmacist that the yeah. higher dose is warranted. Okay, great, yeah. uh, Dr. Rob, this has been so helpful and so such a great overview. I'm re really grateful. I'm, I think we could have been talked to you for another hour easily. Um, I want to thank you and I want to thank, thank the you. listeners and thank Accentrate, A-C-C-E-N-T-R-A-T-E dot com um, for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks. And everybody, um, hope you'll come back to uh, our webinars uh, going forward next Thursday, um, twice exceptional children. Those are children who are high IQ and have learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder. And then Dr. Willens with life stages of ADHD um, for adolescents. So thanks everybody and consider subscribing to Attitude if you support our work. Go to attitudemag.com slash subscribe. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Thank you.